Hi, I'm Sasan Kesravi with Proteus Debate Academy. It's Medium Form Monday, and today we're talking about topicality and other procedurals. Just for the record, I know that book looks a lot like the Quran, but it's actually the Oxford English Dictionary. Also, it's not Monday. It's like Friday or something. Okay, procedurals. Procedurals are arguments about procedure in debate, meaning like the rules or how debate should be done. And really, everything's up for debate in any debate including the debate itself, the rules of the debate, what the topic is, everything. Uh, and all you have to do is convince the judge to vote for you, and if they do, that in my book and in many people's book is a valid reason why you should win. Uh, most procedurals are usually framed around fairness and education, though, so most of the ways that people are trying to convince a judge that they should win is through those lenses, and usually it's because that's why the judge is there and people agree that Debate should be educational and fair. Largely, not always. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that a judge is not a referee, meaning that a judge is not supposed to intervene in the middle of a debate. I mean, there's some tournament rules and stuff like that, but the idea is that generally a judge is not supposed to use their judgment of what is fair or educational to step in and say, you know what, I, th I thought what you did in the debate wasn't necessarily fair, so you lose, especially if the opponents didn't complain at all. Meaning that procedural arguments do the refereeing in the round. So the debaters themselves referee the round. And this is most common in debate formats like policy and parliamentary, but you also see it in something like LD, certainly on the college level, but probably also on the high school level. And procedural arguments are how you referee the round, as I said, and procedural arguments are also a priori voting issues, which I will explain later in this talk. So here's some examples of a few different kinds of procedurals. You have topicality, which is the main one we're gonna be talking about, but you also have like fiat abuse, vagueness, shifting advocacy, speed, picks bad. All of these things are, and, and any procedure that you want to make up a rule for anything you want to say about your opponent being unfair or bad for education, you can use the framework of a procedural to just fill in the blanks and say that. So there's certainly a lot of things you could be doing with procedurals. We're going to be mostly using the example of a topicality. So here's what the structure of it looks like. First, you explain how you think we should debate. We call that the interpretation. How do you think things should be? Uh, in a topicality, that would be like, what do you think the definition of whatever you're running the topicality on should be, or the correct interpretation of it? The, after you've explained what you think, you have to explain how your opponents have diverged from that. And now there's two different things that we've talked about. And remember from the advantages video, we talked about how all debate structure in debate, uh, in debate stems from a defensive mindset meaning that all of these things that we're establishing here are reasons why a topicality would be illegitimate. So in other words, if the negative is doing what you say should be done, then the topicality would fall apart, right? So here's where you're just establishing that that is not the case. Next, you're advocating, once you've proven that there's two different ways of looking at the debate, reasons why yours are better. And we call that the standards. And lastly, once you've shown that your way of doing the debate is better, you just explain why that's a significant enough reason uh, for you to win the entire round outright. So that is where our fairness and education issue comes in, but also our a priori voting issue, which, again, we'll be talking about in a minute. So let's talk about sort of – I made this – chart, which I think is a good visual representation of it. So you start with the resolution in a topicality, but if you're running it on something else, imagine this just being the debate, right? Or whatever is in question, whatever issue is in question. But step one is to interpret that. Like you say, here's what we say this should be. Uh, step two is to say, here's what they say. You just establish that these two things are separate. Next, you explain why yours is better. And lastly, you go into why that means you should win. And that little hand symbol's not two or cheese. That's like the victory symbol. And that's because you win the debate. <laughs> so uh, let's start with a little bit more on the interpretation. So again, that's what you think the procedure ought to be. And in a topicality, it's what your definition 
is or your interpretation of a term or word, you usually specify one part of the resolution, one section of a one word, one phrase that you think is the crux of the disagreement or what's being misinterpreted. So one example of an interpretation could be minimum wage is the lowest amount employees may legally pay to non-tip workers. And this is actually relevant because I have a video here of a demonstration debate that was done at the NCFA, that's Northern California Forensics Association, uh, start of the year like debate camp. Uh, this is with some experienced, at this point, mostly community college debaters uh, doing a demonstration debate. And in this debate, someone runs a topicality and it was already online and it was an easy, it's slow, it's clear. Um, and it's a pretty good topicality, so I'm using this as the example uh, to show you. One of the things I want to point out is that the people on this panel actually have had a lot of success and come a long way, and I think it's worth pointing out. All the way on the left from, at that point, Santa Rosa Junior College, um, later uh, UC Berkeley is Henry Tolchard. Henry went on in his time at UC Berkeley to, I'm certain one time, but uh, he won one national championship at the very least, but I think the real number is like closer to three, like between like NP, NPTE and the National Round Robin, a tremendously successful debater, one of the most successful. Um, next to him is Virginia Kerr, who went on to San Francisco State University and had a lot of success there in her own right. Uh, to the right, so uh, kind of from left to right, number th three would be uh, Alan. Alan was at this point at DVC, my college. I was coaching Alan. He's now at University of the Pacific getting coached by Paul. Um, this is the fall of his second year, so he's by no means bad, but he's improved a lot since then. And to his right is Paul, who is the co-founder of this academy. It was at this point starting his senior year at University of Pacific uh, and uh, now is coaching for them. Perhaps none of that was interesting to you at all, but I think it's really cool how in this panel, in this little debate, there was uh, people who went on in the next couple years to do some really amazing things in debate. But let's hear the interpretation for this topicality the way Alan reads it. First off is the topicality. A is the interpretation. The minimum wage is the lowest amount employees may legally pay to non-tipped workers. Great. Perfectly clear. Uh, yeah. The violation is how your opponent has not met the interpretation. So referring back to that visualization that I made, it's how they've moved away from that interpretation. And in the topicality, uh, it's uh, <laughs> it's usually the topic what we're talking about, right? So it's, would you think that they're off topic, hence the term topicality, but violations can also include extra topicality and effects T. And these just mean that you've gone beyond the resolution. So while you're technically talking about the topic, you're approaching it in the wrong method, and really these are issues for a separate video in and of themselves. But what I want to point out is that oftentimes these are run as their own procedurals, but they can also be used as a type of violation within another procedural. And in this case, here are the violations that Alan is going to read. Let's hear him do that. The violation is that one, they don't meet, is that they raise the minimum wage for everyone. The second violation is that they are extra topical, which means they're going beyond the bounds of the resolution by raising the minimum wage for tip workers. Next is the standards. So now that you've made the distinction between two, these two things, you want to talk about like why yours is better. And standards are the tools you use to do that. So when you read a standard, you really want to be doing two things. You want to explain why your standard is good and how you meet that standard better than your opponent. Let's take a look at some 
potential standards that you could use. There's lots and lots of standards and you can come up with your own. These are just some of the more common, well-established ones. So let's say you were gonna talk about dictionary definition. First, you would explain why using a dictionary definition is good in debate, why it's more fair, why it's more educational, which is usually what we mean by good when we're talking about a procedural. And next, you would just wanna explain how yours comes from a dictionary and your opponent's doesn't, or why yours comes from a better dictionary. Um, and you can see that there's lots of standards here. Um, there's, in fact, even more, and there's lots and lots some people, like some teams, will specialize in just one or two. Other ones will try to use a lot. It's really up to you, and you'll see that some of these are sort of the inverse of each other. For example, limits is the sort of inverse of creativity, and common person is the inverse of dictionary definition or field context. So let's see what Alan does. To use the standards, one is limits that you should prefer to most limiting definition because it allows us to best understand the meaning of individual words in the resolution. Two is field context. This is how the Department of Labor defines the minimum wage, that meaning it is that the consensus as well as what your own agent of enforcement believes it is. So Alan does a pretty good job there. And it's not uncommon for standards to be read just like how he read them. I just wanted to point out that technically he didn't do both steps on either standard. So on limits, he only explains why limits are good, but doesn't really elaborate on how their interpretation is the most limiting. Now, they're sort of taking that for granted because they're running a T and that seems like you're limiting it more. But certainly another team could try to come up and argue why their interpretation or this uh, counter interpretation that they're giving and again we'll talk about that when we're talking about answering topicality somehow meets the standard and is limiting enough to not be a question on the second issue which was the field context they talked about how their interpretation better meets the field context not as much on why field context is important now a lot of these sort of like go without saying, but the concept of anything going without saying in debate is always a risky one. Let's move on to the voters. Um, so this is where you explain how someone should vote on the argument and also why. So the how is that it's a priori and also would include the um, the lens through which that's the competing interpretation and reasonability one. Uh, but the why to vote usually comes down to fairness and education. Um, but on competing interpretations and reasonability, we won't really talk about them very much over here. But suffice it to say that there's different ways of analyzing whether or not to vote on a topicality. A competing interpretations lens of analysis or lens of looking at it would favor more of a line by line flow intensive look. So it would say like, if we win one reason why this topicality is good or bad, toss it out, right? Like be very detail oriented. A reasonability approach would be like, look, at the end of the debate, if you believe this was reasonably off topic, vote it down. Or if you think it was reasonably on topic, you know, don't vote the affirmative down. So the two different approaches to take and there's strategically different reasons why you would want to use one or the other. Uh, let's take a look at Alan's voters. Voters are a priori, which is that you will evaluate this before the rest of the debate because we must decide whether we're discussing the topic before, what the topic is before we can evaluate the debate. Second is fairness, and third is education. Fourth is NPDA rules, we finally act to affirm the resolution. Fifth is that if we don't debate the topic, it leads out in the collapse of the debate. So you can see there that Alan added a couple extra reasons for why you should vote on the topicality, the NPDA rules and like the collapse of debate. Both well and good, you can always add more stuff. Rarely does it do those things make a huge difference, but you can choose to have them make a huge difference if you really want to. Um, this topicality that Alan ran all in all, I think took like a minute and 40 seconds out of an eight minute speech. And that's really where you want to be aiming. You certainly don't want to take more than two minutes, 
um, because you're just wasting a lot of time if you do that. You should be aiming for like a minute 30, minute 40 um, on your sort of like top of case. Well, not top of case, but at, at the top of your negative speech uh, procedural arguments. Now let's talk about what a priori really means. So a priori comes from Greek and it means comes before. And it's a term that you hear a lot in philosophy and, you know, Immanuel Kant used it. And uh, here we mean it to mean a gateway issue. So Kant would use a priori in the context of like a priori knowledge, which means knowledge that comes before experience, meaning things that everyone knows without having to have seen it or lived and whatever. That's going down a philosophy rabbit hole. But here we just mean that as a voting issue, this comes before, meaning that before you can decide whether you like the advantage, you have to decide whether you think it was on topic at all. Because if it's not on topic, it doesn't matter how good the benefits of the plan are. And if you win an a priori issue, you win the whole debate. Similarly, if, well, not actually similarly at all, if you lose an a priori issue, you don't, it, 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 it just doesn't affect the rest of the debate. So meaning, let's say at the top of the debate, you have something saying that minimum wage should be blah, 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 right? If you win that argument, you win the whole debate. If you lose the argument, you have to have the rest of the debate as though you never made the topicality. So the rest of your debate should not count on the topicality winning. I'll explain that more later on. Uh, and you always start with a priori issues just as a rhetorical thing. If you're telling the judge that this thing is sort of the most important thing and the first thing they should consider, probably a good idea for you to start with it. Obviously, you wouldn't want to start like a disadvantage and a counter plan and then run a topicality. But additionally, you want to always start off case with your negative arguments first when you're going to run a topicality. If you really need to refer to your opponent's arguments before you run into your disadvantage or whatever, you can do the topicality, then on case, then back with the rest of the off case. So here is a way of visualizing the sort of a priori gateway issue, really the order of voting issues um, as I see it. So over here we have the clash, and this is what most voting issues center around. So these are like your advantages, disadvantages, counter plans. When you think of most criteria for debates, which in a lot of debate formats is usually net benefits, but in LD or public forum it can be whatever, this is where those things come up, right? Um, but before we can vote on those, we have to make sure that the affirmative meets certain stock issues in their top of case. This would be having a plan. This would be that plan having inherency, meaning the problem's not going to get solved, that the plan's not going to just happen on its own without us having to pass this resolution. Or solvency, right? If the plan is impossible to happen, then there's really no educational or practical benefit uh, or value in us discussing the merits of if it did, right? If you want to talk about a policy, we should probably be focusing on policies that are possible. Um, but before we can really talk about those, we have to get through the gateway issues, which are procedure. Like, is this plan on topic? Is this too vague? And et cetera, right? And only once we establish those things, does the next thing matter? And then finally, the next thing matter. An interesting thing about this is that the clash, meaning the advantages and disadvantages are really the only place the affirmative has access to winning the round in almost all instances. Meaning if you're the affirmative and you're trying to win through your impacts, that's really the only place you're able to do that. Uh, whereas the negative can win on any part of the flow. So as the affirmative, you have to be topical, but being topical is not enough to win a round. And you have to have a plan and meet your stock issues, but meeting your stock issues is not enough to win the round. So that's one of the inherent disadvantages of being the affirmative because there's more ways for you to lose. Um, now, this isn't always the case. You can have things like reverse voting issues and you can say like, why should I, you know, 
like, it, why should I have to lose on this topicality, but the negative doesn't have to lose if they run the top topicality and it is wrong. And generally speaking, I don't think that reverse voting issues are very sound debate theory. And the reason for that is because if the affirmative is told that they can win a debate by beating a topicality, they really have no incentive to ever be topical. All they have to do is get good at topicality, be really untopical to the point where the negative has no chance of beating them because they had no chance of beating them in the clash because they had no chance of predicting what they were going to say. At that point, they have to run a topicality and then they just, what, lose on the flow because the app is better at topicality? Probably not good for a debate. And speaking of, um, you know, shit shows of strategies like that and the problems they cause, um, this chart really should also include the critique, uh, which sort of throws everything out of funk and is a topic for another video. So here I just wanted to show a video of the sort of most technical, highest of high level topicality to demonstrate how it might look like from different from the example you saw, but also how even at the highest levels, it might be faster, it might be more technical, it might include more detail, but the bones are always the exact same thing, it always follows the same order, and really the argument's doing the same stuff. This is from, Paul sent me this round, it's from the 2018 MPTE, which is the biggest, hardest, um, generally considered to be the biggest, hardest, uh, NPDA tournament. This is from either the third round or the third ELIM round. I don't remember. And it's against a Texas Tech team. I think GH is the initials. Uh, the team is going very fast in here. Um, faster than I can really keep up with and much faster than I anticipate any of you are ever going to have to debate against. And Paul transcribed most of this for me. But with this having been said, let's take a look at this topicality. A is the interpretation of Southeast Asian, Southeast Asian countries of term of art used to isolate a collective unit of Southeast Asian countries. Yeah. Term of, Southeast Asian countries the term of art used to isolate a collective unit of Southeast Asian countries is a term of art used to isolate a the collective unit. The A sub point is this is indicative of the fact that it must be all about Southeast Asian countries. The B sub point is this is thus we say affirmative and higher parametricized data in each specific country. The violation the uh, affirmative parametricized data in each specific country. We see it to be subject to violence in all of the countries. Thus we can't parametricize down. The implication be that this violence has to be occurring to them in each of these countries. Violence has to be occurring in each of these countries was a question of theoretical justification absent that there's literally no way for us to research the violation is that they actually did pull the uh, Michael Clinton sessions the way they were able to parameter so the second violation is going to be a question of how they are able to set this on all others but an ongoing system of violence which is until it's a single element of state it's a state single element of state structure violence the first standard is going to be that of uh, the first standard is going to be that of uh, that negative research the subpoena is absent the violence inside of a community there's no we can actually have effective research having a visa but we literally don't know to research the, we, don't, we literally don't know which countries to research in terms of negative preparation which makes it functionally impossible to ever engage in the topic see so we're going to be so my clash is going to be the internal. So saw back in second argument is going to be predictable because the A sub point is the affirmative bias of the overall exposure. Literally, that's something literally any country can be. Or about this in South Asia, B sub point makes it functionally possible to ever know which country should be able to research C sub point. That means we have no internal to topics. This is because you should make it functionally possible to do the negative. This is an operator of the issue for medicine education. Always default to any interpretation of the work above. So when he talks about having done the work above, this was the second procedural that they ran in this debate. So when they were talking about why fairness in education is an important voting issue, that hasn't changed from the last time they said fairness in education was important. So they're just saying refer to that same stuff above. So yeah, yikes, that was incredibly fast, but you'll notice that the core function of how topicality works never really changes at any level of debate. So regardless of whether you're reading it at the slow speed you saw it earlier, or you're reading at this speed now, it's pretty much the same as far as what it is and how it functions. And if you end up getting this fast, more power to you. So some defensive strategy about topicality. By defensive strategy, I mean using the topicality to stop the other team from being abusive. You want to have certain T's and other procedurals prepared before the round. Uh, now, if this is a set topic like LD, public forum, policy, you probably want to, well, it's very uncommon in public forum, but LD, policy, 
you want to identify what those key terms that you're going to have T's ready for are, and that's going to depend probably on what arguments you want your opponents to not be able to run, what arguments you want to be able to run, etc. Um, you never want to rely on your topicality lower down in the case, right? So the interpretation of your topicality, right, like the rule or the vagueness or the definition you're using should never be something that you rely on a later argument to be true. Because again, always remember, if you win that argument, you win that interpretation, you've already won the whole debate. So it only strategically makes sense to perform the rest of the debate under the assumption that you haven't won it. And you don't really, it doesn't really functionally make your topicality look worse. People understand, at least at a certain level of debate, that like, yes, here's my topicality, this is why I think I should win, but just for the sake of clashing. And that takes us to the next point, which is suicide teas are thing. It's done sometimes, just not often. Don't do it. It's not good strategy. So suicide T would be your entire negative case being one topicality, meaning you don't clash with your opponents at all. You don't have any reasons why their interpretation of the resolution has disadvantages, no disagreement with their advantages. You just straight up say, this is a bad interpretation. I can't engage with it. It's unfair. They should lose. The reason why this is really bad is because the judge is probably looking for some, even if you like try to engage with it and you show that it's difficult, that really just helps your case on the topicality. But additionally, if you say nothing or you make no attempt to engage with it at all, a judge is always going to be thinking about what they would have said if they had to have gone against it, and the more they think of things they might have said, sort of the less inclined they are to believe that you didn't have any choices. In addition to that, and sort of on the, you know, as an expansion on, you always want to articulate abuse. And what that means is, if you're saying they are somehow making you lose ground, in other words, there's arguments that under your interpretation you would have been able to run, but under how they phrase things you're now not able to do, it's always really useful to show that those are arguments that you prepared, or those are arguments that you would have been ready to talk about in the round, rather than, I mean, and that might be reading a part of the argument or holding up a piece of paper or whatever. A potential abuse would be like that limits the affirmative or the negative from saying this sort of thing without any indication that you planned on or intended or advocate for that sort of thing. Potential abuse is just generally much weaker because it's not really much of a loss if you weren't going to say it anyway. Uh, now some offensive strategies, which is basically how to use the running a topicality to your advantage. And the first way to do that is by cheating, uh, which obviously I don't recommend. Uh, one example of this that I would consider cheating was actually not even, I mean, sometimes you see people running topicalities on things that are perfectly topical, but they just know that they're better at topicality than their opponents, and they just want to beat them by being better at the techie argument. And I don't think that's a very good use of anyone's weekend. But this example that I have here, banks equal riverbanks, is actually the affirmative uh, in it's somewhat of a funny story, uh, abusing the topicality. Uh, this was at a tournament that I was at. This was a round that was supposed to judge, but I missed the ballot, so it got pushed to somebody else. And the affirmative goes in, and the resolution for this parley round is that the United States federal government should regulate banks or like significantly increase regulation on banks and the affirmative goes in and they're like yeah blah 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 we increase regulation on banks advantage one is the environment and they start talking about like the environment and wildlife and all of this stuff and really most of their speech goes by before the negative finally raises their hands and they're like wait are you talking about river banks and the affirmative is like, yeah, we're talking about riverbanks. So the negative predictably goes up and they run a uh, topicality. And I think this is I think this is a novice round, but I'm not sure. Either case, it was the first tournament of the season, basically. So not super experienced, super well seasoned competitors. And 
they basically fell into the trap that the affirmative thought they would, and they ran a topicality, and their main standard was dictionary definition. Not really citing a dictionary, but their argument was if you look up bank in a dictionary, it'll tell you that it's a financial institution, to which the negative came up in the MG speech and said, turn their dictionary definition standard. We did look it up in the dictionary. We looked it up in like two dictionaries, and Riverbanks was always the first definition. And they ended up winning that round in front of that judge that thought that was a hilarious turn of events and a hilarious strategy. I don't know how I would have voted. I certainly wouldn't have wanted to vote for the AF, but that's one way to do it. I don't recommend it. Another way to use a topicality as an offensive strategy is as as a time suck. If you run three topicalities and uh, then like, you know, a disadvantage and a counter plan, the your opponents are going to get really nervous about having to answer the topicalities because they know as a priori issues if they lose any of those or if they drop any of those then they lose the debate outright so the strategy is to get them spending a lot of time trying to answer that so that hopefully they make key drops against your on case arguments and then later on when you come up in the second negative speech you're like yeah we're not really going for these top for these procedurals or these topicalities but now you know let's just focus on these arguments that they mishandled i think that's a shitty thing to do i think it doesn't make you good at debate i think it only works against people who are inexperienced and slow and the people who do this end up hitting a wall where they can no longer cheat and take advantage of novices and then they stop having fun they quit debate and the activity is better without them but whatever um and really, the only offensive way of using T's that I advocate for is to try to force links, or which is creating double binds. So what that would mean is that in a resolution where the affirmative has some leeway, or you think the other team might not do the resolution in the way that would link to your disadvantage, what you would do is you would run a topicality, or you would prep a topicality that says you must do... The resolution in the way that basically I thought you would which is why I wrote my disadvantage and what that does is it puts them in a position of either not being topical or linking into your disadvantage and it puts the affirmative in a position of having to decide okay do we want to delink the disadvantage say no that's straight up not what we do and here's why we're still topical or do they want to not risk uh the a priori voting issue and just say sure 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 we meet your topicality we'll, we totally do it the way that you talk about in the da we just straight up outweigh that or we have a turn on the da or something else or your da is non-unique whatever it's up to them but i think it's um a viable strategy um, that is useful. So let's just talk now about which topicalities to prepare. Um, obviously, if you are in a research-driven format of debate, you have the same topic for a very long time, you want to identify these T's early and probably have all of them in your back pocket, but still be ready to run on a topicality on a word that you know you don't necessarily uh, anticipate having problems with and in partly you want to develop this skill very quickly so that you identify early on and prep which T's you need to write and then write them pretty quick so any term or word in the resolution that limits the AF is something you want to have a topicality ready for a uh, term like significantly or substantially being in the resolution really is only there to protect the negative by limiting the AF. Um, and this stops them from doing things like increase in action by 1% or by like one instance. And that way they don't really get any significant disadvantages, but then they just do some marginal good. This is to prevent that. So let's look at some previous NFALD topics and use these as our examples for which of these words I would have topicalities ready for. So here's this year's topic that just ended. Resolve the United States federal government should substantially increase actions by United States Cyber Command to prevent complex catastrophe and or protect critical infrastructure. Uh, so you might think 
that like cyber command or complex catastrophe or critical infrastructure is the T's that are really important because in your average public forum or LD debate, those would be the words that you are probably providing definitions for for the judge. But don't think of it like that. Don't think of it as the terms that the judge might have the least familiarity with. Think of it as the areas which the affirmative could be abusive because if you're going into a NFA LD round or really any sort of like more technical debate round uh, and you don't know what cyber command is and your AF somehow like isn't cyber command, you have bigger problems uh, and probably the rest of your case isn't all that great. But let's take a look at the words I would have T's ready for and that's substantially for the reason we just talked about. We don't want the affirmative to be able to make some incremental action to get away with. Increase actually had a lot of, well, one, it shows a directionality in the action that the resolu uh, the affirmative must take, right? If they say, use Cyber Command to blah, 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 they could say, Cyber Command stops doing stuff, or Cyber Command disbands, right? And that becomes really difficult to predict what disadvantages or negative arguments you need to have. So increase is important because of the directionality, but it's also important because there was a lot of good T's this year that were saying increase means that the thing you're increasing has to already exist. Um, in other words, that your plan can't be for Cyber Command to start something new, some sort of new legislation or some new regulation. It has to be an increase of an existing Cyber Command effort. Now, there was also a lot of really good answers to that topicality argument. So that's not to say that any one of these T's is like an end-all, be-all. It's just a starting point of a debate, but that's a good place for the debate to go. Next is prevent complex catastrophe and protect critical infrastructure. Uh, probably also protect will be underlined. Uh, but the point here is that this limits the affirmative to certain, one, have to demonstrate how those things are under threat. And second, it limits them from certain offensive actions. That is actually the majority of what Cyber Command does, unless they can show that it's somehow a preemptive strike. Let's look at 2018. Resolved, the United States federal government should substantially increase the regulation of state and or local police misconduct in the United States. So if you're playing along, try to pick the words uh, that you would have topicalities ready for. Here's what I would have them ready for. First is substantially, again, for the exact same reasons. Increase, again, for the same reasons. But here the word regulation is interesting <clears throat> because it's interesting to think what does it mean to regulate misconduct um, because it seems to indicate that it doesn't change the policy of what is or is not misconduct it just changes the policy surrounding how we treat misconduct when it happens maybe it doesn't indicate that but that's a topicality debate worth having in my opinion and the next one which is really interesting is misconduct because there was a lot of affirmatives saying, okay, like the police are too militarized. The military is giving them military grade weapons that is encouraging them to, you know, act like they're the military and have tanks and shit driving down the street. And that's bad. The negative sometimes would say, but that's not misconduct. Misconduct is you breaching the code of conduct. And if this is legal and within the code of conduct, then it's not misconduct. To which the affirmative might say yes, but it leads to misconduct, and then you have the whole effects D debate, blah, blah, blah. Point is, that's a really interesting word to look at in the resolution, which can paint how the entire topic gets talked about. Next, the 2016 topic. Resolved, the United States federal government should substantially increase restrictions on bioprospecting. So this one should be a little easier to follow along, substantially increase and restrictions, sort of for all the same reasons that we've talked about so far. And once you get used to this, if you're doing something like parliamentary debate, you just off the bat know which words to have T's ready for, ready in your back pocket. And the thing is that the topicality argument that you write for a substantially We'll have a different violation in a different topic because it's a different plan, but you might have the same interpretation for substantially that you use on every topic in every debate. 
substantially is by 50% or more, substantially is enough to blah, 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 right? And you can use that from topic to topic. Increase. These are terms that we see a lot and they sort of signal to people who are more experienced which topicality arguments to have ready. So that's it for topicality arguments uh, as an introduction. Certainly there's much more to talk about in terms of overall strategy or whether to think of topicality as a question of accuracy or what. Um, but this will definitely get you ready to start having topicality debates.